Hi guys. Well, we're getting down to the bitter end of Peruvian plunge. I appreciate you uh, sticking with me here as we head into chapter 27, the penultimate chapter of this long, strange trip, which we're going to title <clears throat> Into the Peruvian Garden of Eden. And we're going to kick off with a quote from songwriter Greg Brown from his song, Who Would Have Thunk It? We used to say I could walk all night, and we could, and we did, down a gravel road to the tiny town with the door always open. Now we say I could walk all night, but it's not true. We can't walk all night. No, because we don't want to. And this will bring us up to July 23rd through the 28th, 2009, from Nueva Eden, Peru, otherwise known as New Eden, Peru. And I can see my computer is already off to a bad start. All right. I awoke that Thursday to a spectacular sun-washed morning in the Peruvian Amazon. Fueled by a strong cup of coffee and renewed hope for the revolution inspired by the lovely morning, I set off on my next spiritual adventure of spending my retirement nest egg to save the rainforest. And what better place for such a dream to bear fruit than my next destination? Nueva Eden, New Eden, Peru. The name spoke of fresh new beginnings, perhaps the very spot I would be welcoming in the new paradigm on December 21st, 2012. Who knows? To reach that heavenly garden of earthly delights blooming in my gringo imagination, I first had to get to and through the hellhole of Itawania, Peru, the literal end of the road. For now, you know, in 2009 anyway, on the banks of the Mother of God. My first choice to get there would be to take a boat. However, I was a seasoned enough traveler on the Rio Madre de Dios to know that it could take hours, if not days, to find a boat heading downstream. I had prepared myself for the more likely event that I would be making the three-hour trip to Itawania in the back of some kidney-jarring, pants-ripping logging truck, or sand truck, or rock truck. Arriving at the little ramen noodle store <clears throat> in downtown Shintuya, where the trucks veered off toward Itawania, I was not happy and not surprised <clears throat> to learn that it would be two to three hours before the very first truck would arrive. I settled down on top of my bag of cannonballs to wait it out right about the time <clears throat> the two half-empty buses came rolling into town. Perhaps there would be a few folks from those buses who would want to split the cost of boat fare to Itawania. I stashed my bag of cannonballs at the store from where I believed I would be leaving and jogged down the hill to the boat dock on the slim chance <clears throat> that I might be able to find some other folks going my way. I was shocked to discover when I got there that there was, in fact, a boat just getting ready to depart. If this was not good enough news, the boat captain said he could give me a ride all the way to the lodge in Nueva Eden, about an hour downstream from Itawania, for the unbelievable price of five dollars. Four people from the bus were piling their luggage into the boat and preparing for a pleasant journey downriver on this gorgeous sunny morning. There was just one small catch. There always is in the Peruvian Amazon. My goddamn bag of cannonballs was back up the hill in the ramen noodle store. I begged the captain to give me five minutes to run up the hill to get it. Hurry up, gringo. The boat is ready to leave. One of the passengers growled at me. I promised my fellow passengers I would be back in five minutes 
and hauled ass back up the hill. I hoisted my heavy bag of cannonballs onto my back and raced as fast as an overburdened burro can race back down the hill to the dock, only to discover when I got there the captain throwing everyone's luggage back out of the boat onto the beach. What the hell? As my fellow passengers glared at me, the boat captain explained that in the five fucking minutes that I had been gone to retrieve my luggage, he had accepted another job. The regular boat that hauled the lumber from the cursed logging camp across the river was broken down. Since he did not know when I was going to return from my errand, the words five minutes in the Peruvian Amazon can easily mean an hour to most people living there, he figured he could make a couple of bucks before heading downstream. And how long, I asked him, would this little side job take? Una hora. One hour, he said, with half the confidence of a Peruvian bus driver who would have told me 30 minutes. One hour. Are you sure? I asked him. Si, senor. Soy seguro. I am sure, he promised me. He fired up the boat and disappeared upstream, heading toward the logging operation. It was now 8.30 in the morning. <clears throat> Hiding out from the other infuriated passengers, I snuck away to take refuge in the broken down lumber boat. <clears throat> Some 90 minutes later, our boat, dangerously overloaded with the heavy rough sawn logs, chugged into view. The five of us grabbed our various pieces of luggage and prepared to head out, assuming that the lumber was headed to the port of Itawania. Wrong! The lumber was headed right to where we were standing, <clears throat> and we continued to stand there while a couple of kids, using these mean-looking metal hooks, unloaded the heavy logs from the boat onto the beach. As they worked, I asked one of them if this were the only load. Si, senor, he assured me. Thirty minutes later, as soon as the last piece of wood hit the sand, the captain and the two kids hopped back into the boat and, with no word of explanation to any of us waiting passengers, took off again for the lumber camp upstream. It was by this time, right about the time the Itawania bound trucks should be passing the ramen noodle store where I had run to get my bag of cannonballs earlier that morning. Some 90 minutes later, at around noon, the overloaded boat returned with its second load. Of course, as it was now lunchtime, the two kids broke for 20 minutes to eat. As they relaxed from their hard morning's labor, I asked the other kid if this were the last load of wood for the day. Si, senor, he assured me. Forty-five minutes later, as soon as the last piece of wood hit the sand, the captain and the, and the two kids <clears throat> hopped back into the boat and with no word of explanation to any of us waiting passengers, took off again for the lumber camp upstream. It was by this time, right about the time that the Itawania bound trucks should be pulling into their destination. Avoiding the daggers in the eyes of my fellow passengers, who by this time had been waylaid for almost five hours because of my damn bag of cannonballs, I slunk off back to the store for lunch. In the past 40 hours, I had eaten two packs of ramen noodles and eight, Ore eight Oreos. <clears throat> que pasa, gringo? The, the surprised woman at the store said when she, thought, when she saw me, I thought you went to Itawania on the boat hours ago. I scrounged the only two ready-to-eat items in the whole store I could find saltine crackers and Oreos and walked back downhill to the dock to eat my lunch in the broken down lumber boat. 
As I sat there in the hot sun washing down my meal with a warm coke, three boatloads of eco-tourists came roaring down the mother of God in their comfortable tour boats on their way to one of the several lodges downstream. I could see them munching sandwiches and drinking cold beers as they raced by us. They waved at me as they passed, and a few even took photos. The wake from their boats pitched me forward, and half my crackers spilled into the wet bottom of the lumber boat. One of my fellow passengers sauntered over to me and pointed to the receding boats. Why aren't you on that boat with all the other gringos? He wanted to know. I shrugged sheepishly. An hour or so, or so later, the overloaded boat returned with its third heavy load of murdered trees for the day. As the kids, moving more slowly than they had, had been the first two times around, began the back-breaking job of unloading the wood, the beautiful day took a sudden turn for the worse. A menacing line of black thunderheads rolled in from the mountains of Manu, and cracks and booms of thunder echoed up and down the Mother of God. The first fat raindrops started dappling the water as the last log of the day was hoisted out of the boat and onto the sand. It was now 2.45 p.m., more than six hours since I had first run up the hill on my five-minute trip to gather my bag of cannonballs, and more than five hours since the captain had made his one-hour promise to me. <clears throat> As the skies opened up and the full fury of the storm began to soak us and our luggage, we all scrambled into the roofless boat. I retrieved my tarp and took shelter under it, disappearing into my blue plastic world and leaving my fellow passengers who had once been looking forward to a lovely river journey on a gorgeous sunny morning to their own soggy fates. For almost an hour I hid under the tarp, completely missing the visual delights of the journey downriver and thinking about what my fellow passenger had said. Why aren't you on that fancy tour boat with the roof and the sandwiches and the beer with all the other gringos? It occurred to me that I had never once seen another gringo on a cargo boat or even on a public bus with me since the day I had left Cusco on May 22nd, not even one lousy, scruffy 22-year-old hippie. No wonder all the Peruvians stared at me like I was such a fucking weirdo. I am a fucking weirdo. The rain started to let up right about the time our boat pulled into Itawania to refuel and to pick up a few boxes of unidentifiable cargo, I emerged from my blue plastic world just in time to see a beautiful rainbow arching over the single saddest acre of land in the entire Peruvian rainforest, Itawania, Peru, the literal end of the road in every sense of the term, geographically, physically, and spiritually holding my umbrella above me like I was taking a stroll through a suburban park. I struggled up the steep, muddy riverbank to survey the depressing two-block stretch of existential despair. The whole town with, was plastered with signs announcing the Grand Fiesta coming to Itawania in a few days. I stopped in front of the town's only Restaurante. I pizza? Do you have pizza here? I joked. The three lost souls hiding out from the rain in the salmonella trap just stared at me uncomprehendingly. No pizza? I pollo frito? Do you have fried chicken? Quickly tiring of my lame, moose like comedy routine, I headed back toward the cargo dock. 
On the way, I spotted something on the far bank on the Manu National Park Cultural Zone side of the river. It was some sort of yellow hunk of metal planet-eating machinery with balloon tires the size of elephants. Unable to figure out what I was looking at, I asked a fellow filling a five-gallon gas can from one of the dozens of 55-gallon drums lying about what the thing was. He explained that it was a logging truck. <clears throat> With his fingers, he traced for me the dim outline of the distant network of logging roads spreading out like cracks in a chipped piece of china, disappearing into the hazy distance toward the hills of Manu. From the river, you would have never known the devastation that lay just beyond the thin curtain of riverfront trees. My eye-opening lesson in creative Peruvian map making, these joke cultural zones surrounding the country's national parks were clearly a successful effort by the Peruvian gover government to make it appear that a lot more land was being protected in the Amazon than actually is, was aborted by the shouts of the boat captain calling in his flock. I returned to the boat and we headed off again down the Mother of God River. Within minutes of leaving the existential wasteland of Itawania, we were transported back into the watery wonderland that I remembered so fondly. If I had not been so recently educated on the reality of what was going on just behind the curtain of, of trees along both banks, I, like all the other gringo eco-tourists, would have sworn I was back in the primeval rainforest. Yeah, right. Perhaps an hour later, when the sun was sinking low behind the mountains above Manu, the boat captain veered off the main channel into a rocky side channel that threatened to beach the boat in midstream. Pulling up on a stretch of rocky beach that looked like every other stretch of rocky beach on the river, he announced that we had reached my destination, the Amaracari Eco Lodge. The only sign I could see of civilization was a couple of boats a hundred yards or so down the beach. The Nueva Eden docks, I later learned, but I hopped into the knee-deep water and waded ashore. A young Peruvian guy appeared out of nowhere like he had been expecting my arrival and guided me across the rocky beach and through a thick stand of banana trees probably plantain trees, actually. We crossed a rutted out logging road, the future Itawania Nueva Eden Highway, <clears throat> passed through a stand of lovely jungle and emerged into a weed-choked and vine-choked clearing of perhaps two acres. Two dogs, barking like banshees, came racing down the muddy path to greet us. I could hear the jabbering of Spanish language shouts that sounded like some sort of family squabble coming from one of the buildings ahead of us. My guide shouted to announce our arrival. The squabble immediately ceased, and next thing I knew, <clears throat> I was being mobbed by a family of five friendly Peruvians, all talking to me at once in unintellig unintelligible Spanish. Trying in vain to follow the basic thread of the conversation, I was led on a grand tour of the grounds, each family member eager to show me something different. Essentially, the basic layout of the place was very similar to Manu Learning Center, though a wee bit rougher around the edges. A community kitchen and dining room at one end, a, a detached bathhouse at the end of a short boardwalk, and three two-story bungalow, bungalows all in a line like Philadelphia row houses. This seemed to be the basic pattern of eco-lodges in the Peruvian Amazon. Buy a big piece of land, 
in this case, 300 acres of jungle, bulldoze out an acre or so in the middle, then cram all the bungalows so close together that you can hear every snore, fart, and passionate moan from every one of your neighbors. I chose the second story of the second bungalow for its panoramic balcony that afforded a commanding panoramic view of the other buildings and the weed-choked field, which I could barely make out in the fading light, was at least ringed by some truly magnificent real old-growth jungle giants the first big trees I had laid eyes on in the Peruvian Amazon since leaving Manu Wildlife Center more than a month before. Ignoring the other buildings and the abandoned field the best I could, I focused on the dying sunset as I unwound in my hammock while the family busied themselves with preparing dinner. I was famished when they finally called me to the table. In 48 hours, my diet had consisted of the two packs of ramen noodles, a half a pack of saltine crackers, and 16 Oreos. For dinner, I was treated to a bowl of macaroni, a boiled potato, and half of one Peruvian hot dog. Over dinner, I told Freddy the caretaker of the lodge and the ringleader of the family, that I really wanted to visit the camping shelter on the banks of the Rio Blanco some eight miles back in the jungle. I could tell this idea was about as well received by Freddy as the suggestion that he and I go roll around in a nest of fair delances, but he agreed to take me. The only catch was that we had to go the next morning as he had to be back on Saturday to prepare for a big load of real tourists, i.e. ones that brought their own food and didn't bum off him and his family who were coming in on Sunday. I said all I needed was for him to show me the way in and I would hang out in the jungle for three nights and return on Monday. Dinner was over at 6.30 p.m., and the family, with nothing else to do because the solar-powered TV had died during the afternoon's heavy rains, went to bed. With nothing more to do myself, and knowing I had a big day ahead of me the next day, I did the same. <clears throat> Which brings us to Friday, July 24th, 2009. <clears throat> it was a damn good thing that I went to bed early, too. <clears throat> because at 3 o'clock in the fucking morning, I was yanked from my peaceful slumber by the crowing of a brainless rooster who did not even need a distant streetlight to confuse with the rising sun which I used to believe was the trigger for one of the single most irritating sounds on the planet. Here I was, literally out in the middle of nowhere, in 300 acres of jungle along the Mother of God River, 50 miles from the nearest town, and I was being assaulted yet again in the middle of the night by a goddamn chicken. Obviously, this was my karma for all that chicken and, and rice I eat down here. Lying there in the middle of the night, in the middle of the jungle, listening to the crowing of that cursed rooster, the following rant occurred to me. There is a saying in English about getting up before the chickens. This saying has no Spanish translation, at least in Latin America, for the simple reason that the English language saying implies that chickens sleep late enough in the morning for at least a few people to rise before they do. In Latin America, on the other hand, 
the chickens are often up and crowing before the people hearing them even go to bed. It is just common knowledge in the United States that chickens sleep until the sun comes up when they, like so many other birds with less irritating voices, get out of bed. Perhaps you recall how the producers of Green Acres would let listeners know it was a new day on the farm. They would show a rooster crowing, and he would be crowing to announce the rising sun. Latin Americans watching the show probably have no clue what that crowing rooster is supposed to imply, as there is no connection between the two related events south of the Rio Grande River. It's really a simple formula. Sun rises, rooster crows. Somewhere in the middle of the Rio Grande River, between the U.S. and Mexico, there was, and still is, a fundamental breakdown in this simple sun-to-chicken formula. <clears throat> Latin American roosters somehow lost track of the genetically programmed information eroded and encoded in their very DNA that tells them they are supposed to wait until the sun comes up to wake up and crow. I would be willing to wager that the chickens in El Paso, Texas sleep in every morning until sunrise while their Latin American cousins in Juarez are crowing at 3 a.m. The line is that well defined. In 50 years, I have never once been awakened by a fucking rooster crowing at 3 a.m. It simply is not a risk you take in the U.S. But cross that old Rio Grande River, boy, and look out. <clears throat> the farther south you travel, the worse the problem gets. I used to jokingly call Guatemala the land of the midnight chicken, but that was before I got to Peru. As I've reported before, I miraculously survived a month in the real land of the midnight chicken without dealing with the problem, namely because there are no roosters in downtown Cusco or in every other eco-lodge I've been in before a Maracari eco-lodge, but the little fuckers have more than made up for lost time since then. I have lost more hours of sleep to roosters crowing in Peru than to all the dogs barking and horns honking and fireworks booming combined. The loudmouth roosters are only the first half of the mystery down here in Latin America. Equally mysterious and in many cases and in many ways more maddening are the damn deaf Latin Americans themselves who are apparently completely immune to the shrill alarm clock of crowing roosters or barking dogs or blaring jukeboxes at 3 a.m. In 20 years of traveling down here, I have never once heard a Latin American dog owner tell their fucking loudmouth dog to shut the fuck up. I don't know how many times I've been lying awake, seething in rage over some goddamn chicken crowing so close to my ear that he sounds like he's sharing the pillow with me, that I have heard somebody snoring away in the next room like they were passed out in the womb of a sensory deprivation tank. What the hell do Latin Americans especially Peruvians, who will no doubt sleep right through the second coming of Christ on Judgment Day, no matter how loudly Gideon blows his trumpet, use for fucking alarm clocks to wake their comatose asses up. Jackhammers? On the slim chance that I ever do buy a Maracari Eco Lodge, the first thing on my to-do list will, to be, will be to feed that fucking rooster to a crocodile. Better yet, I'll stick his ass in the stew pot and serve him over rice so I can finally get a real meal around here. 
thanks to that goddamn chicken, I had already been up for five hours when Freddy and I headed off onto our great jungle adventure. Finally, for the first time since hitting the Peruvian Amazon on May 22nd, I was going to get to experience the Indiana Jones thrill of hiking out under the deep, dark rainforest and sleeping out under the stars. Of course, I was going to get to experience this thrill under the weight of a five-pound day pack while Freddy got to have the pleasure of lugging my bag of cannonballs down miles of muddy trails and across slippery log bridges for hours. Just the hike from the beach to my bungalow the day before was enough for me to figure out that I had no chance of being able to take a real hike in the Amazon rainforest without a porter to carry my shit. While yours truly got to miss the cannonball aspect of my first overnight expedition into the Amazon, even I was not prepared for the other adventure of hiking into a rainforest. Rain. And I'm not talking about a refreshing little shower to wash the sweat off. I'm talking about a three-hour ass-whipping drubbing that would have made a catfish long for a warm, dry bed. I'm sure I made a macho sight slogging down the sloppy trails and plunging through the rising creeks and rivers with my little purple plastic poncho and my $3 Salvacion umbrella. The stoic Freddy, who had no poncho or umbrella to shield him from the deluge, deserved a gold medal for his superhuman effort to never once complain or to ditch me and run ahead to the shelter as Marino had done. Only one time did he take shelter inside the cover of a kapok tree buttress and ask me very politely exactly why I was so hell-bent on taking an eight-mile hike through a monsoon to sleep in a soggy tent for three nights. Well, if I'm going to buy this place, I need to know what I'm buying, the hopeless real estate investor told him, and Freddie never brought up the subject again. <clears throat> the lodge's 300 acres stretch for a mile or so behind the lodge, but the guy selling the place had some kind of arrangement with the Madre de Dios government, or at least Freddie claims he does, to let his guest camp at the shelter on the river. As far as I could tell from my rough map, the lodge's property backed up to a Maracari, so I was none too happy and none too surprised when we stumbled into, first, an illegal logging camp, and second, onto a plainly obvious logging road heading back north towards Itoania. Clearly, lumber pirates were confident, confident enough in the lax law enforcement, assuming there is even a law to enforce, to smash roads right through the middle of the forest, saw down the jungle giants, haul them back to Itoania, and load them onto boats to Puerto Maldonado in China with zero concern of getting caught. Meanwhile, I was supposed to get permission from four levels of Peruvian bureaucracy to take a walk in the woods, dodging pirate gold miners destroying the riverbanks all the while. It wasn't until we got to the Aguas Negras, the Blackwater River, that we finally hit a big enough barrier to stop the human termites in their balloon tire tracks. I made it perhaps 12 feet along a slippery algae-coated log that served as a bridge over the 40-foot wide river before chickening out, returning back to the bank and taking the cold water plunge through the river itself. Freddy went right on across the slippery log, which had the traction of an ice skating rink with every remnant 
with every remnant I had of dry clothing and sheets. Miraculously, he negotiated the dangerous crossing without mishap, and I entered the real jungle for the first time since leaving Manu Wildlife Center. For perhaps three miles, we hiked under the canopy of old-growth trees, a walk that ended way too soon when we arrived at our destination, the camping shelter on the banks of the Rio Blanco, the White River, which was exactly the same color, brown, as the Blackwater River. <clears throat> Freddie pointed to the other side of the river and announced, there is a Matakari. What? For the past five soggy, muddy, miserable hours, I thought we had been hiking in the damn reserve that I had been trying so desperately to get inside for weeks. Freddie corrected me, saying no. We had been hiking in something called the Zona Franca. I think that's what he called it which, if I understand correctly, is basically some kind of close cousin to a cultural zone that is owned by the government of the state of Madre de Dios as opposed to the nation of Peru, or something like that. The bottom line is that whatever you want to call these bullshit buffer zones, they are obviously wide open territory to anyone with a chainsaw and a truck. To this day, I don't know who the money is behind these operations. The labor is being supplied by the natives themselves, but it's a mystery to me who is paying the natives for their labor. I'm going to take a wild guess here based on nothing but my own intuition and tromping around in the woods in the Peruvian Amazon that somewhere along the money trail you're going to find some local, state, or federal government official with a greased palm. So great! I still had never yet set foot in a Maracari, and I still haven't. <clears throat> This hunk of jungle is the size of Yellowstone National Park, for Christ's sake, and I might never get inside the place to bring you a first-hand report, at least until Hunt Oil has rammed 300 miles of seismic testing trails through the reserve, at which time I'll just be able to walk right on in without a guide. <clears throat> Wherever the hell it was actually located, the camping shelter was your basic rough plank and thatched roof affair, about 20 by 40 feet, perched on the edge of the, deep, of the steep riverbank. It didn't exactly offer the wilderness experience I was hoping for, but I'm going to be honest here. As wet and cold and miserable as I was, I would have preferred it to be a damn holiday inn. Do not ever let anyone tell you the Amazon jungle is hot. England, no joke, was hotter on that day. We were blue-lipped, teeth-chattering, freezing. The first and foremost goal of the afternoon was to get a fire going to warm up our shivering bodies and to try to dry out our soaking wet clothing. You can imagine how much dry firewood there was to scrounge and I was supposed to camp here for three nights? Yeah, right. Freddy finally managed to scrounge some firewood by hacking up some old dry rotted lumber with his machete from the construction of the shelter, but kindling was rarer than kangaroos in that part of the sang soggy rainforest. I was just about ready to surrender at two in the afternoon and bury myself in my tent when Freddy came up with a brilliant idea for a fire starter. The dozen or so empty single-use plastic bottles littering the shelter. As the pungent toxic fumes of burning plastic bottles filled the air of the jungle, I pitched my tent as far as I could from the sputtering flame while still taking advantage of the plankwood floor and the roof. 
An hour later, Freddy had succeeded in coaxing an admirable campfire out of the mountain of plastic bottles and the scrap lumber, and my wet clothes were steaming away on a rock beside the fire while I huddled over the carcinogenic heater wrapped in a damp sheet. Well, I've answered one great mystery, I told Freddy and Spanglish as we shivered together over the little fire. What's that, he asked. I understand why there are no more Indians living in this jungle anymore and why they all moved to Shintuya. They were sick of freezing their asses off for 10,000 years. And I wasn't joking. I could just imagine my honky ass dressed in nothing but a penis sheath and a feather mask trying to get a lousy fire started out, started without benefit of a butane lighter, a mountain of plastic bottles, and a pile of scrap lumber to get me started. There I was with three layers of wet clothes, a sheet, three foam camping mattresses, and a nylon pup tent raised up off the wet ground on a wooden floor, and I was still freezing just as I would have been the first monkey out of the canopy to get away from the sweat bees, I would have been the first Haraboot native out of Amarakari and into Shintoya. When you are cold and wet and dealing with a bunch of lousy wet firewood, there is nothing on your mind except getting warm and dry. Nothing. I don't care if if you do have to sell out your culture and your identity to do it. Freddy somehow produced a hot spaghetti dinner over the smoldering little flame, and we huddled around the picnic table to wolf it down. Not one to complain. All Freddy said was, Tomorrow I will be out of here at dawn. I will be home in two hours. He pantomimed with two fingers how fast he was going to be hauling his ass back to his gas stove in his warm, soft bed now that he wasn't weighted down with my infernal bag of cannonballs. Spirit tapped me on the left shoulder and pointed to the remains of the campfire. Exactly how she wanted to know that I think I was going to cook for three days and nights, never mind how I thought I was going to get my bag of cannonballs back to the lodge on Monday. A half hour before dark, my clothes were dry enough to put back on, so I traded my damp sheet for my almost dry clothes. I stretched my sheet along the drying rack by the fire <clears throat> and went to smoke a bowl to get what I could out of the crack between the worlds on such a gray, miserable day. In the hour or so that I sat by the Rio Blanco, staring wistfully toward the unattainable Amaracari on the other side, the river rose at least two feet. Obviously, there was no way I was going to be able to stay there until Monday. I went to break the bad news to Freddy that he probably wasn't going to be back home as soon as he would like to think the next morning. When I got back to the shelter at the late hour of 6.30 p.m. on a Friday night, he was passed out in his tent, snoring like a chainsaw four feet from my three mattresses. Shit! I dug my earplugs out of my bag of cannonballs to drown out the sound of Freddy's snoring, which of course shut out all the other jungle sounds, the frogs, insects, night birds, and of course the rain that I had been looking forward to listening to on my first night of real camping ever in the Peruvian Amazon. Even my earplugs were not enough to drown out the typhoon that slammed into our little jungle bivouac during the night. I was so miserably cold when the storm hit that I actually burrowed between my mattresses using one mattress as a blanket. The balance of the night devolved into one of those desperate, interminable waits for a dawn that take about a week to arrive, a wait made even more interminable, 
interminable by the fact that I had gone to bed before 7 p.m. Freddie was even more ready for the dawn than I was, as it was his cue to bail on my gringo ass and get back to the comfortable lodge as fast as he could. He was out of his tent and packing up his few possessions while Peruvian chickens still slept. Amigo, I have some bad news for you, I called to him from inside my mattress sandwich. There is no way I can stay here another day. Four hours later, we were back at the lodge, slurping down hot coffee and gorging on fried egg sandwiches. So much for my great jungle adventure into a Maracari, I headed up to my hammock on the second story porch of my bungalow, which is pretty much where I stayed for more than 24 hours while the rain continued to fall and fall and fall. And we're going to break chapter 27 right here. Be back with part two in a minute.